Welcome to episode 30 of the Food Grads Podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a molecular science graduate student and career partner with Food Grads. This week on the podcast, I interviewed Lori Nickel, the chief executive officer of Second Harvest, Canada's largest food rescue charity. They recover fresh, unsold food to protect the environment and provide immediate hunger relief. In this episode, Lori spoke to me about her role at Second Harvest and all the amazing things that they do, from rescuing food to developing training and educational programs, such as those for food safety and food waste reduction. We talked about how Second Harvest is a data-driven company, and Lori also cleared up some misconceptions that I had about working at a charity. And I learned more about her job as a CEO and what this work actually entails. So enough with that introduction. Let's get on to the show. Thank you so much, Lori, for coming on the podcast. It was kind of a spur of the moment thing, but I thought about all the stars aligning and I was like, I need to get you on the podcast because you're a part of Second Harvest and with Second Harvest dealing with food waste, it's such a big issue right now. And to see that there's an organization that's actually doing something about it and that there's careers in this area, I thought who better to get on the show to talk about it. So thanks for coming on the show, Lori. You're so kind. Thanks so much for letting me come on your show. I'm super stoked about it. Awesome. So for those who might not know who I'm talking to, I'm talking to Lori, who works as the CEO of Second Harvest. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about what this organization does and what exactly is your role? Well, as you mentioned, I am the CEO of this great organization, Second Harvest. And in a nutshell, we rescue surplus perishable food from right across the supply chain and make sure that it gets to charities and nonprofits across the country. And we do this for two reasons. One, because food waste and landfill is a direct contributor to climate change. The amount of methane and GHGs it produces is about six to eight percent of all the GHGs in our world. So we really have an issue there. We also want to make sure that that food can get to charities and nonprofits who often simply don't have budgets to buy food or not enough or don't have healthy food. And so let's make sure that it's getting eaten because that's critical. We also do research because all of our decisions are driven by good solid data. So we do research, we rescue, we do training and education. And you know what? We also have a lot of fun. That's awesome. I know I'm already going to divert the conversation for questions, but one of the <laughs> things that, that stand out is it's so silly that I would never think about it. But you mentioned research as someone who's like a science student, obviously that research is going to stand out. And it never occurred to me that an organization would use research to combat this, but it makes total sense. <laughs> Well, of course it does. So the truth is, when I became CEO of Second Harvest, and I have a long background in food security and in agriculture, I was surprised to find out, like one of the first things I wanted to understand was, okay, so how much food is being lost and wasted in Canada? And not only could I not find Canadian data, everybody was kind of using this old FAO data, and it wasn't accurate. It was, I mean, it wasn't primary data. It was kind of a best guess. And so that, you know, was shocking to me. So I commissioned Value Chain Management International, and that's what they do. They are food loss and waste experts and researchers to commission a study, which we have called the Avoidable Crisis of Food Waste, where we learned 58% of all food produced for Canadians is lost or wasted. We literally waste more food in this country than we consume. That's crazy. I mean... I know from what I've seen in my personal experience about food waste, and it's it's just insane that it happens, and it's really good that your organization is dealing with that, and the fact that you've identified it's actually happening, but I'd like to know, where is this food waste coming from? Well, that's a great question, and that's one of the reasons I really wanted to do this research is I often felt the consumer was getting blamed for a lot of this, and because I run a logistics business, we have fleet of truck trailers and and street trucks and warehouses and move food, I know that primarily we're getting our food much further up the supply chain. And so what we learned was manufacturing and processing is the highest amount of food uh, lost and wasted across that chain. Producers, 
retail, which everyone loves to talk about, is really quite small at only 4% of all the food that's lost and wasted. They've, oh, wow. they've got really good controls in place. And at the household, I think it's around 20%. But again, go read the avoidable crisis of food waste. We made something called the roadmap, and it is following a tomato through its life cycle. So we could really understand, because I like things that are really easy and digestible. <laughs> so really understand where is this getting lost and wasted? Why is it getting lost and wasted? And providing solutions to eliminate or at least drastically reduce the amount of food that's getting lost and wasted. So it's everywhere. It's wow. everywhere and we all have a hand in it. Well, that isn't surprising considering how we are with food, but would you be able to give an example from a producer standpoint? Let's go to a tomato example. What's happening there? Sure. Let's talk about a tomato. And a lot of this is based on what we call aesthetic criteria, which is not what I think a lot of people think. They think it's this ugly fruit. I mean, that's a part of it, but it's really about how businesses and industry purchase food. So when we forecast tomatoes, we have to forecast high because there could be a weather event or there could be insects or a number of reasons. So you, you do plant more than you need to accommodate for those. But then there are specifications. So for example, if I am selling my food to a burger joint, and that means my specification of tomato has to be a certain size to fit the bun of that specific burger joint. Now, if that burger joint refuses them, I can't actually sell it to another burger joint because they have their own specifications. And as you'll notice in a grocery store, you'll see the exact same thing, right? Like we all want our food to be perfect and to look a perfect way. And we, we pick around it to get that right food. So mm -hmm. right at the beginning, we're overproducing. Specifications are creating a mess. And then if you process it, one of the biggest culprits to food loss and waste are these arbitrary best before dates. And that is ridiculous. So people and industry are throwing away millions and millions of tons of food because it is close or past a best before date, which actually is not an indication of safety. It is an arbitrary date put on by manufacturers to sell product. Yeah. I was having this conversation with someone in my lab a few weeks ago. We were just talking about best before dates and it's amazing. For example, yogurt, if you just mix it up, it's fine a week after the best before date. It kills me because it's sour milk to begin with. So <laughs> that's just, you know, um, exactly. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's one thing about best before dates, right? Like a best before date, if you haven't opened the product, they're very arbitrary. Once you open a product, then you have to be very careful, right? Like you don't want to mm -hmm. leave it because you, you can get some foodborne illness from that. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, Oh my goodness. At Second Harvest, we have a great resource on our website that tells you exactly how long your food is good for. And more importantly, outside of just that, if you freeze your food, just freeze it. Everything is freezable. Then it stops the degradation process right there. So there's lots of ways of it. This is why I wanted to keep you on the show and to share these resources for making it more accessible. You did mention earlier that a Second Harvest does help with training and such. Do you have workshops that help to explain these types of things? You betcha we do. <laughs> we have all kinds of training and education and webinars. I believe there's 60 plus e-learning courses on our website. And then we have webinars. Bob Bloomer is often one of the people that presents on household waste. We just have a great team here. And, and then we also just have downloadable resources. Like we, we are resourced. We also resource on, you know, food waste audits, but also food safety, right? So it's really important for the charities and nonprofits we support that they can ensure that the food that we're giving them stays safe as they make meals with it or pass it out to community because this is perishable food and there's temperature control. And so we even certify people in food safety. That's amazing. Wow. That that's really cool. <laughs> actually. Right. Because <laughs> it's one of the things that, you know, we, we do talk about best before dates, but food, food safety definitely is still a concern. And I do think that yep. more people definitely need to get more aware of it from a consumer level, but also just getting more people who are passionate and professionals getting into the industry. So it's really cool that it could be like a more approachable name, you know, second harvest kind of encouraging that, that growth over in that area. 
Exactly. And also, you know, we work with charities and nonprofits and, and often food safety certification is quite expensive and yes. they can't afford it. So come to Second Harvest. <laughs> yeah. It's very deeply discounted, deeply, deeply discounted. Well, that's awesome. Like look at all the resources I'm already getting out on here, but <laughs> as much as I also love learning about this type of stuff, I also like to learn about stories and those types of things. A lot of people just think of working in these types of organizations just for volunteering, but not actually yes. thinking that as an actual career. Okay. I'm going to just <laughs> speak to that. I'll, I'll speak to that, but I also want to speak to Often people look at charities and they think they're volunteer and, and building out careers in this sector. Now, the truth is, as a CEO of a charity, my job is to put this place out of business because <laughs> what charities do is they are filling a gap because there is something intrinsically wrong with our system. So in our food system, there's a problem. We have too much food loss and waste in our uh, social service system. People are not provided the income they need to live, which is why we have to give them food. And so I just, I want to preface it with that, that while it's important that people just know that when you go into charity, it's, it's not for a career. I mean, it can be, but it's really just, they want to solve a solution. They want to fix a problem. It doesn't mean that, you know, we're all employable. We're great. We'll get <laughs> jobs at other charities and close them down too, but that's always <laughs> in the back of my head. So, I mean, I come through this, <laughs> to this position pretty organically and, and non-traditionally. And, you know, I went to school for computer science, which is fascinating. I'm a systems analyst, but I was also incredibly poor. And so I, I came to food security because I had to feed my own three kids. And I was 26 with three sons and my husband left and I was terrified. And so I had to, you know, well, not had to, I volunteered at the child nutrition program to help support my own kids to get the food that they needed. And so that was my introduction really into food security and food support. And what was interesting is I've always been working in the food waste space because I would go and collect food from different retailers or different businesses. And that was all food they were throwing away. And this was good food. Like that's what is so frustrating to me. It's like, this is food often that we get, maybe not at retail, but everywhere else up the supply chain, this is food that's never even hit retail. This is better food than you're eating at home. <laughs> that's what we're <laughs> collecting. And so I've worked in this sector in, and I've worked at an organization called Food Share, really understanding food system and agriculture. And I did that for a number of years. And I'm really uh, passionate about child nutrition because I know that if students do not have the right food in their bodies, they their educational outcomes are, they're significantly lower. And it's completely unfair that just because you do not have the money or your parents do not have the money to provide you the necessities that you may need, you're going to do less well than somebody who has those things. And that's just by birth, right? Like this mm -hmm. is a lottery. So that I find incredibly frustrating and I will continue to be a passionate advocate to make sure everybody can access good food good, healthy, perishable food. Because, I mean, we all know if we're not, if we haven't eaten rich or poor, we get hangry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big candidate of that and I hate it about myself, but yes. Exactly. So, I mean, we, we know how important nutrition and sustenance mm -hmm. is. And so I came to, to Second Harvest because I work nationally and I wanted to get back to my local roots, but my background is scaling organizations. And so, of course, Second Harvest is now national. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Toronto organization. Okay. Here. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting your story coming into this type of thing. I've worked in some food companies and when we were throwing out some waste, I almost want to start crying when I went home because I was just like, I, I don't know how this is possible. Now looking back, I was only a year out of school, barely, and I was still overwhelmed with everything. It didn't even, sadly, despite me being so upset, it didn't even occur to me to reach out to other organizations, maybe try to put that encouraging word into the organization because I just didn't think of it. And I hope that schools and these food technology programs that they talk about these types of things. So people are armed with the knowledge that they can go in and change these organizations from the inside out, because it's a horrible feeling throwing these things out. It, it really is. I couldn't agree more. And I think that there really is a heightened awareness on food loss and waste, at least 
compared to what it was five years ago, even mm -hmm. that people are looking at this. I mean, the truth is there's an economic benefit to preventing your food loss and waste at source, right? Like mm -hmm. you will save money for your business. So we really need to hammer that home because ultimately we want to prevent food loss from happening, period. Now, should it occur, and there will always be some, then divert it to people first. But let's prevent it first yeah. and then divert it. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes total sense. And, you know, going back though, to what we were saying about charities are there to actually get you, you know, you're trying to get yourself out of a job. That's, that's a really interesting way of putting things that I never would have thought of because I'm the more of a traditional person where I think about wanting to much stay in a, in a career, like a certain place for a long time. But I know maybe that's different for others, but I wanted to know if you could talk to the space of working into a charity. Honestly, it's a business like any other business, right? Okay. So when you're in the corporate sector, we're, we're a business, right? We are compliant to the same rules and regulations as any other business. We work with CRA. We have compliance rules around food safety, like, like any food business. So it really does look the same as any business. We have staff, we have logistics staff, we have technology staff who are building innovative products for us. We have a product development team. We have a marketing communications team. We have finance and admin development, which is fundraising. But I think if you flip that into a corporate culture, that's really just sales. So honestly, it is the same as a corporate structure, except you have your mission driven by a cause. Now, I can't say that's not true for some corporations, but there just really is this tangible, we've got to fix the world component that isn't in every corporation. But there, there is opportunities across the charitable sector in, in every vein. So whatever you are passionate about, there is a charity that you could be working at. <laughs> that's amazing. No, that's great to think about because out of school, you know, you think of maybe, I feel like it may be in the science side or even in the food industry, my first thought wouldn't be that there would be something that aligns with those types of things. You think of actual businesses that produce, let's just say, like you mentioned product development, that would be something that you would just automatically assume to go to a small company or a large company. But I would not think there would be maybe something that you could use your skills along the lines of charity. For sure. I mean, we're innovative. We have to be. We're incredibly efficient. Mm -hmm. We've built out technology platforms that are being used nationally and and even the training and education pieces, right? Like those are our products. And often charities have social enterprise components to their businesses. So really it, it's, it's just another sector, like technology sector. There's all kinds of jobs in the technology sector too. There's marketing communications, there's still finances. Even though their core deliverable is technology, there's all kinds of other jobs and roles inside of those businesses. Do you mind me asking without specifying that? It's like, these jobs aren't paid, right? Like they're not. Oh um... my goodness. We're a business. <laughs> okay. Of these jobs are paid. We believe in paying people a fair living wage. So of course they're paid. And I think we all have to get out of this mindset that a charity, there's something lesser than for staff in a charity. I, mm -hmm. I just refute that a hundred percent and believe strongly that you should pay people what they're worth and volunteers as great as they are, are often low-income people. And I also struggle with that. Like, why would we ask low-income people to always work for free? There's just something wrong with that mentality. So we need to just disrupt this sector so that the world understands that, you know, we're not here to volunteer. We're here to fix a social injustice. We're the most important group ever. We're fixing the world. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. You know, if we could, could you imagine how many more problems would be, could be solved with, if more people just got paid to actually do it? If I could help people and get paid for it, like why, why wouldn't I want to do that? Like. But charities pay people. So that's a misnomer. I think that mm -hmm. charities don't pay people. Charities do pay people. Not depending on where you are, depending on how grassroots that charity is, you know, sometimes the pay is not great, mm -hmm. but coming out of school, Going into corporate, the pay is not great. So it's all relative. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No, that is true. And again, I look at the reports and all that type of stuff and I'm like, wait, people get paid for this and they're doing good. Maybe this is, this is, why am I thinking this is a bad thing? You know, these are people who are putting their life wanting to do something and it just aligns with their goals. So, well, there's also this, I don't, 
ridiculous mentality of this admin shouldn't be 10 10 or less or something i'm like uh there's a great guy named oh dan Luza Luzi. we talk about impact in charities so what's more important the lives you're impacting or the 10 percent admin line i would argue that it's far more important to help more people than it is to make sure you've got this bizarre little budget line that actually is not grounded in anything scientific at all. It just was like, well, nonprofit and charities are less than, and people should be doing this for free. Why on earth do we think that? That is the most ridiculous thing in the world. People are doing critically important, saving the world stuff. Why on earth should they be doing it for free? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I think that, again, it, it encourages more people to just go on and do it. Well, shifting gears, I just wanted to hear what you think would be your ideal vision of what Canada would look like in terms of a food supply system. What, what are you striving for with your program to try to get to? Well, that is just a humongous question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had, a, I figured it was a doozy. So yeah, an egg cultural system that didn't waste would be really the ideal. I sit on Canada's Food Policy Council, Advisory Council, just to figure out what kind of legislative levers we could put in place to ensure that we are really eliminating as much food loss and waste as possible. That's where my, you know, that's where I sit in the agricultural chain. I also think we need to pay our farmers more. I think there's a lot of agricultural things that we should be doing and mm -hmm. need to be doing, but primarily that's it. Like, what are the levers we need to put in place to prevent food loss and waste from happening in the first place? Could you actually tell me a little bit more about that and what, what that type of role looks like? Sure. So Canada has a mandate, a food policy mandate. And I want to say within the year, there were a number of people selected to sit on the Food Policy Council with different backgrounds and focused on different things. And obviously I fit under a couple of umbrellas. But mostly it's food loss and waste, but also child nutrition in this country. And the goal is really to build out or, or recommend to the minister potential legislative or policy items that could have a significant impact and looking at it from every angle. So how is this going to impact industry? How does this impact charities? Sure, but also just consumers. Like what are the outputs to make sure that we're making recommendations based in really solid A science and understanding the consequences? Because often what we find is people have great ideas, but there's a lot of unintended consequences that come with them. So for example, you know, those uh, K cups, are they K cups? You know, yep. Those little yep. The, the individual coffee cups. Exactly. So my understanding is that the person who invented those was actually an environmentalist who... Oh was tired of throwing away the dregs of a coffee pot. So the unintended consequence <laughs> is that we have all of these. And so those are the things that we really need to look at is how will this impact just the many, many layers of agriculture and industry. This might be a silly question, but what exactly is a policy? Like what, is it a suggestion? Is it something that follows through with rules? That's exactly what a policy is. It is okay. a rule. So you can create an incentive policy. So like a tax incentive, for example, to farmers to, to donate their food. Great incentive. Is it a policy? Eh, it's, it's legislation. Or you can not incentivize and have a consequence to not having preventative measures or like health and safety, think of that. If you don't have appropriate health and safety measures in your business, then you can be fined or you can be arrested. So huh. those are the kind of, those aren't the exact policies, but that's really what a policy is. It's building out a framework and, and some teeth to it, whether they be good or consequential, which requires a business or an individual to do something. Okay. That makes sense. I, I find it amazing that, you know, to have a council or people that have the capabilities to even think at this scale because you know it's so it's much easier to think of food waste you know try to meal prep throughout the week to avoid waste but then taking it to a higher scale that affects multiple people multiple like industries like you said consequences planning it out using data it's 
it's amazing things ever get done to be honest with you or like even get <laughs> like just to think on that scale it's it's not something i do on the on the daily so to know that there's people doing that it's just amazing yeah there are people doing that all day every day there's a whole lot of bureaucrats in this country <laughs> I know I, I try to pay attention to like the ones you're mentioning agriculture is the one that stands out to me and I just think you know I just it, it, it's hard to wrap my mind around it the, the fact that people like how would I ever even get there you know with not that's my goal but I'm just saying that there's people will with the skills and capabilities to to do something like that but I think you could get there if it's of interest to you, <laughs> you know, I, I did not go to school for this and I'm very involved in government relations and well, that's true. Yeah, that is. Don't worry true. about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, like, I, I guess this would be a good segue to just talk about some of the things that, for you, what have been some of the most important skills that you've picked up over your career that you're using now, and is there any that you're working on right now? Oh, so many skills. A lot of them are actually what I would call soft skills, so, and that is really about leadership and and mentorship and coaching and understanding and reading people uh, and listening. Really, I'm a great lifelong learner and I love to listen and I love to learn. So there is nobody I won't talk to. <laughs> it, honestly, like I learn all the time. Well, you, you know, there's nobody you won't talk to because there's always something to learn. Even when you think you know everything, well, if you think you know everything, you're always wrong. And if you're the <laughs> smartest person in the room, then get out of the room. <laughs> go get into another room so the skills I, I continue to work on those skills but I mean always learning new things so even the food loss and waste space there's a lot I had to learn when I came in here from child nutrition and oh. so it meant okay who are the right people that I need to talk to to understand this and it's networking into those places and with those people and and getting their you know feedback on what's happening in the space I had to learn about technology. We built out a, a national app. I have to learn about marketing communications. I have to build awareness. I have to learn about international politics. Like, so it's just about learning. Like it's always like, you never know when you're going to need this information and be kind, be good to people mm -hmm. because that's really what matters, right? Like relationships, just be a good person. Yes. I know there's you, on, on the surface. It's, it's just, People, you know, if you're kind people, you never know where it's going to come back to you in the future. But then at the end of the day, it's just good to be kind. You know, it's, it's nice. It makes you feel good. It makes everyone else, it helps bring others up that are around you. And I think it's a lot of an easier life to be kind than it is to not. I think so too. And it's not to say you're not going to get frustrated and annoyed with people. Mm -hmm. Of course you are. Just know to keep your mouth shut and think about it for a bit before you respond. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good advice too. That's good Breathe advice. deeply because two will pass. <laughs> and nothing's all that important, right? Like mm -hmm. in the moment, I mean, there's grand things that are very important, Yeah. but in the moment, you know, yeah. we're all going to die. So <laughs> <laughs> things in perspective. So when you're saying though, you know, learn uh, like you, you're working on networking and all those types of things, do you just like, actively you know take courses or that or do you just kind of know I got to work on that and just be more self-aware of it because I'm just yeah. trying to okay it's self-awareness I'm I'm and but that's also the way I learn right like mm -hmm. I am I'm not a good academic learner I can't read things and understand them I have to really be immersed in it so that's and that's me right people learn differently mm -hmm. uh, so I am really more about talking and talking to lots and lots well listening and listening to lots and lots of people Okay. I think that goes for some, I mean, I'm an academic person. So for me, I'm going to say reading helps me and all that, but I, I like that. It just goes to show that there's different walks of life to, to get to different ways. And we're all just having to focus on what works for us. And exactly. it's just kind of how it is. And um, another thing is we, we've been talking that just kind of came to my mind is, you know, we talked about the ideal vision of kind of what would food waste but I, I was curious to know is there any like new ways or services w that you would recommend to, to help limit food waste at, let, let's just talk towards like our our listeners right now for something they can take from this episode that's more actionable that's different from just you know composting and doing those basic things 
Well, please, you know, composting is not actually all that helpful. It still emits greenhouse gases. And I mean, I think people just think because they've got a green bit that they're doing the right thing and they don't even notice that they're filling it up, right? We've just turned food waste into this system. And so we don't even notice it. So compost, you know, what would make your life easier is buy less food. Save yourself some money and just buy less food. Disregard best before dates, use your common sense and measure the amount of food that you're wasting. And when I say measure it, I mean like really just, you don't have to weigh it, but you know, eyeball it, write it down and mm -hmm. then write down how much that cost you. And at the end of the week, see how much money you've wasted because that is a motivator. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not the, if you can't get excited about climate, and I think most of you can, get excited about your pocketbook and, and, and just purchase less food. Yeah, it's, it's an ongoing battle. Like I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm the best person for it. I am trying to actively work on it, but it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing that you have to constantly keep on top of in terms yep. of really, it's, it's not a lifelong thing that goes away really. Yes, you can get better with your habits, but really being self-aware is it's, it's tough work. <laughs> it is, but I also think people give up too soon. Okay. And they think they have to boil the ocean, right? Like I've got to get to like this incredible place where I'm not eating meat anymore. And I'm not, you know, I'm like buying almost nothing mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. And you don't, it's small steps. And you know, you do a small step, like 10 times, it becomes a habit. So just think about the one thing you're going to do, not about the 30,000 things you could be doing just one. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after six months, try to like, take your time. We all get better. We know better. We get better. We do better. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I like that because I'm one of those people that want to do everything at once. And then just, it gets, it gets overwhelming. And then I realized that I probably took off more, I bit off more than I can chew. And then it just gets discouraging and you know, exactly. not what we want. <laughs> so do one thing well for a little while until you feel comfortable to do another thing. Mm -hmm. And also just talking about it. Talk, 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 talk. The more people talk about this, then it gets into everybody's, you know, brain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they all want to do it, right? Exactly. And I'm hoping that like, you know, having more conversations like this bring you on the podcast because there's a lot of chatter in terms of food waste. And I think that it's actually finally we're getting that really that push, like, and hopefully it's a sustained push that just keeps going and gets better and snowballs because yes, food waste has kind of been talked about for, you know, the past 10 10 years, but now I really feel like companies are seeing from an economic standpoint, seeing it from an environmental standpoint, and that things are going to be changing. I really hope that. They are. I mean, if businesses are looking at their ESG outputs, so they are changing. I, I mean, I, I don't think we can put too fine a point on this. We are in for catastrophic events. We're already inside of them. We're inside the climate crisis, and just because it hasn't hit some of us, because we have the luxury of living in Toronto, doesn't mean it's not going to it really soon. And we're talking about people dying. People are dying in New York right now. There are fires all across the Western part of the country and in Northern Ontario. Like this is impacting people's jobs, people's lives. And we're not that far away from it in this city. So I think the climate crisis should be scaring us all to do better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's definitely affected me. I'm not gonna, the past few weeks, it's been very, since I've heard that report that recently came out, um, I can't remember, I think it was the two. Yeah, it's the UN. yeah it's that the UN. one, that one has really, has not left my mind any day since I've heard it. And it kind of feels a little hopeless, but I don't want to feel that way. So I would rather change our conversation <laughs> to try to get to something that's hopeful in terms of being able to actually do something in the small space. So with, with everything we've talked about today, I'd like to hear your advice for students or young graduates. What would you give advice for someone who wants to go into this food waste space or to make something for their career in that area? Well, I hope you are passionate about it and are, are deeply interested in it. What, would I, what advice would I give you? Learn about it, right? There, there are opportunities. There's opportunities and there are many, most of them are not in the nonprofit space. They're in the corporate space because corporations and food businesses are looking at greatly diminishing the amount of food loss and waste they have right across the supply chain. So there's 
tons of opportunity right now and it's just growing. Okay. Well, if you want to see change in the world, I guess you have to be the one who helps to make the change. And if you can be someone who you don't necessarily have to work in a charity or you can, if that's the choose, but if you go into a corporation, you can be the one who helps to divert the waste so the charities don't have to do anything with it. So, well, they can prevent the waste. There we go. But that's the key. That's what I'm can, looking for. <laughs> yes. And then if they have some, they divert it to us. There we go. There we go. <laughs> well, I think that is a good place to end the episode. I want to try to leave it on a little bit of a positive note, but I wanted to thank you, Lori, for coming on the show. I hope that our listeners get some really good, valuable advice and get to learn as much as I've learned today, how much Second Harvest has all these different resources that are available in terms of how to take action yourself, train, get involved, all these different things. So thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. That was episode 30 of the Food Grads podcast. All the notes to this podcast can be found on the Food Grads website by clicking the podcast tab on the homepage. There you can find any notes to any past or future episodes. If you like this podcast, but you wanted to get your questions asked live, then make sure to check out the partnership with Careers Now and their interactive mentorship series. Where guests, if you like this podcast, but wanted to get your questions answered live, then make sure you check out our partnership with Careers Now and their interactive mentorship series. Where guest speakers who currently work in the industry will describe their career journey, motivations, and aspirations in the food and beverage industry. From when this episode is being released till February 15th, 2022, Careers Now will have guests from all across the industry, from everything from R&D to finances to HR, you name it, there's a mentorship session for you with the potential of more to come. So if you want to check that out, then check out the links in the show notes and we'll direct you there. Anyways, that's it for this week's podcast. Thank you everyone so much for listening and I will see you next time.